it's just shocking to think that anyone would think a to carry out a, a shooting is acceptable but to do it in such a time and place you know it's quite hard to conceive of why anybody would do that okay so um it's quite a, a shocking one really it was a um, there was a 23 year old man called Asil Alasai um, and it, it was back in February 2017. It's what should have been a very joyful, happy day for his family um, because his sister was about to celebrate her engagement with a party that all of the family were attending. Asil and family members had hired cars, they wanted to you know, make a big show in support of his sister. And Asil was on his way to his sister's engagement party and he was on Daniel Hill in Upperthorpe. Um, and that's quite a, a relatively quiet residential street. Um, you know, it's quite near a park. Um, and it was in the middle of the day, 1.30 p.m. And a seal was shot dead with what was described in court as a Dirty Harry style, uh, long barreled revolver by a gunman who was traveling in a VW golf car on the road. Um, and a seal was shot in the shoulder, well, the, the, gun, the gun shot entered on his shoulder um, and traveled through his heart and he, he was killed through, through a single gunshot wound. Um, and so eventually three men were charged in connection with a seal's murder. Um, they, they were named Matthew Cohen, Dale Gordon and Keel Bryan. And they went, in, they went on trial, charged with Asil's murder back in February um, 2018, so around a year later. Um, and I think it was quite a complicated one for jurors to understand because um, they've been charged on a joint enterprise basis. So what this means is that um, the prosecution don't have to necessarily determine who it was that um, fired the a fatal gunshot wound. Um, all three men were alleged to have been equally involved, equally culpable, because they were all involved with the planning and execution of a seal's murder. Well, um, it's it's quite complicated. They didn't know exactly. The prosecutors, they don't. Well, first of all, first of all, they don't have to necessarily determine a motive, but it seemed as though there was some sort of. Um, feud going on. Um, it was, jurors were, held, were told during the seven week trial at Sheffield Crown Court that in the weeks uh, leading up to the fatal shooting, um, Matthew Cohen, so one of the three defendants, had slashed a seal's brother, Salah, in um, the face with a pair of scissors. Um, and the senior investigating officer, Detective Chief Inspector Steve Whitaker, said that. He believed there was some sort of incident in the weeks running up to the shooting that had been the, the catalyst and it was something to do with that. Um, and the three, the three murder accused were all found guilty after the seven week trial. And I've got a quote here from the um, judge in the case. Lord Justice Mayo said of the possible motive, um, it is not clear why you decided that a seal had to be shot. We may never know precisely, however both he and his brother Salah were street dealers in Class A drugs and there was evidence of previous incidents of violence or threatened violence towards both of them. It is overwhelmingly probable that whatever the precise reason it had to do with the supply of drugs, but he added, whatever may be said about the way in which a seal earned his living, he was a young uh, man, only 23, much loved by his family, who did not deserve to be shot down in cold blood. Um, and so the court was told that following um, a seal's death, um, the three um, per people in the car were assisted by, with a, with, by a number of associates um, and they attempted to dispose of the evidence. The VW Golf car that was used um, in the fatal shooting was found burned out. Um, a few miles outside of the city centre um, and they also attempted to get rid of pieces of evidence that connected them um, and their movements prior to the shooting being carried out. I think
think it was quite an extensive um, investigation. Uh, DCI Steve Whitaker said at the time that at that point it was one of the biggest murder investigations that South Yorkshire Police had been involved with for some time. And he said it wasn't just that it was um, an extensive investigation, but it was quite complicated because not only were the defendants refusing to speak to police, but, but I think possibly because of the links to crime, witnesses were also reluctant to engage with the police. Um, and he said that to secure the conviction, police had to trawl through hundreds and hundreds of hours of CCTV, ANPR cameras, um, that they recovered almost 2,000 exhibits, obtained 700 witness statements, and downloaded um, over 100 devices like phones and that kind of thing. Um, and cell site evidence did form a big part of the case, so it allowed them to um, trace the movements of those that they believed to be involved with the murder. Um, it, it can be quite difficult because um, sometimes you'll have complicated evidence from, say, pathologists, and they're using all of this jargon that you won't necessarily understand and there's also you know in, in a case like this where um, you have multiple people with something quite complicated to understand you have to try and simplify that so you know people can have a, a true sense of what's going on without it being too complicated um, and so what will normally happen is that the prosecution will open their case they will have an opening statement and that it doesn't it's it's not necessarily evidence but it's essentially them outlining what they believe um, the case to be about um, and it's how it opens and then the prosecutors call their witnesses bring their evidence um, with each witness being cross-examined by defense barristers and then it's that at that point where um, the defense cases so um, after the prosecution case is finished, um, it's at that point that the defence case begins and um, defendants are given their opportunity to give evidence if they want to. Um, it's not mandatory, but judges tend to warn that if they um, choose not to, then it may be something that the jury will hold against them because they've chosen not to um, you know, kind of essentially give their side of the story. The jury returned unanimous verdicts and um, the defendants all received very lengthy sentences. So they obviously, they received, they were jailed, they were sentenced to life imprisonment, but they were also received um, minimum terms of 30 years each, which is, 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 is considerably longer than your average murder sentence. Um, because the minimum term for those who use guns tends to be a lot more elevated to reflect the serious nature of, of using guns on the city streets. So essentially what, what a joint enterprise is, is when a, um, a group of people are thought to be equally connected to a crime and so it's the idea that they've pro probably planned together, they've probably set out who would have which role. And with the murder of Asil al -Asai, um, they the prosecutors could not say who it was that fired using the Dirty Harry star gun, um, who fired the fatal shot that killed Asil, but they believed that Matthew Cohen was driving. Um, and the VW Golf that was used in the drive-by shooting uh, was registered to him. And I remember during his evidence um, at the trial that his argument was, well, um, who would be so stupid as to use a car that was registered to them to commit you know, such a serious crime? But the jury obviously um, rejected that account when they found him and the two others accused of murder guilty. And so, um, you know, sadly, we do see, see shootings on Sheffield streets. Um, you know, I think over the last year there have been two fatal ones. South Yorkshire Police, I know that they are, you know, trying to put more resources into tackling gun crime on our streets. And in 2020, the force set up um, an armed crime team in response to what they suggested was a slight increase in the number of firearms discharges. Um, and so 
you know, that, that, that team also covers knife crime as well, but I think, you know, they have been quite focused on trying to bring the number of incidents involving guns on South Yorkshire streets down. And, you know, you do see them coming through court. Um, you know, I think what perhaps some people don't realise is that even possession of a firearm carries a mandatory minimum sentence of five years in prison, um, unless there are exceptional circumstances. And, you know, I, I regularly hear judges saying that, um, you know, concerns about, re you know, rep fear of reprisals and things like that um, do not count as exceptional circumstances um, because most people who um, are in possession of firearms tend to be involved with organised crime and gangs and things like that. And so that in itself does not count as um, an exceptional set of circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that it was broad daylight, you know, it was 1.30pm, it was a Saturday afternoon, and there would have been a lot of people around. Um, you know, there's a big park nearby, in fact it was um, previously used to host tram lines, so, you know, it's a big park, it's well used by families, and, you know, anybody, any member of the public walking past could potentially have been, you know, hurt in the crossfire, and it's just shocking to think that anyone would think a, to carry out a, a shooting is acceptable, but to do it in such a time and place, you know, it's quite hard to conceive of why anybody would do that. Thank you.